What do you think when I say the name Colonel Sanders? Finger licking good. How many of that came right to mind? Finger, right, right? What comes to mind when I say the name Truett Cathy? Really? Chick- Thank you. Somebody here is educated in their fast food restaurants. Chick-fil-A. Is- Truett Cathy is the founder of Chick-fil-A. Who didn't know that? Wow. Maybe I need to preach on that more often. <laughs> you guys didn't know that's like Christian chicken, right? At Chick-fil-A. Uh, what would you say that if I, if I said the name, what, would you- what comes to mind when I say the name Albert Einstein? What? Okay, good, good. Uh, how about this? What comes, to na- what comes to mind when I say the name Hitler? Yeah, see, like, whoa, whoa. Hopefully that doesn't, not the reaction when somebody says, you know, Pastor Zach, you know, whoa. <laughs> okay, Hitler. Uh, what, what about if I said Michael Jordan? Okay, <laughs> goat. I'm gonna preach on that one day, that term goat. Uh, George Washington, Napoleon, Mother Teresa, Cleopatra, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the first person to really fight against the Ku Klux Klan. Neil Armstrong. How about this? Joe Biden. Calm down, everybody. And it caused a lot of division in the church. Donald Trump. Okay, hold on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I know. Calm down, everybody. Calm down. These are, these are hu- I know these are hugely uh, controversial names in our culture. I, I will say this, that I do believe that it is our duty as God's people to vote and be part of what goes on in our country, and I hope you do that. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You need to go before the Lord and do that yourself. But I want to ask you an even more important question. What comes to mind when I say the name Jesus of Nazareth? I just I want you just to let that sink in for a second what comes to mind when I say the name Jesus Christ it's probably the most controversial name in the history of the world why is it that you can talk to, about God to so many people but the moment you bring up the name of Jesus it gets awkward have you ever noticed that It's a pretty amazing thing to think about this name, Jesus. We sang about it all morning. What a beautiful name it is. We're starting a new series today called Why Jesus? And I just, man, this might be the most important series I've ever preached because we're really going to delve in to answer the question, why Jesus? Why does he matter? Why did he come? Why did he die on the cross? Why did he rise from the dead? Why should I care? Why do so many people love him and hate him at the same time? Why? Why does it matter to you? Why should it matter to you? Why does it matter for your eternity? The question, why Jesus, is the single most important question you will ever answer. Why? See, we're not just in this religion of Christianity. We have a God, and his name is Jesus. So we really need to get down to the brass tacks of the issue of why you, if you are a Christian today, believe what you believe. And we're going to wrestle with this, this question for the next several weeks. An author by the name of Philip Schaff in his book, The Person of Christ, said this about Jesus. He said, this Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since, and produced effects which lied beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pins in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men in ancient and modern times. This is a huge person we're talking about. 
and we're gonna discuss it to the best of our ability. And I wanna ask you this question, who is Jesus to you? Let's bring it down to a really personal thought, a really personal heart check. Who is Jesus to you? The answer to that question determines your eternal destiny. It, it determines your purpose in this life. It determines relationships. It determines how you choose what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. Who is Jesus to you? Now, if you look at the religions of the world, Mormons would say that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. In other words, they're, they're brothers. If, if you were to look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses would, would say that Jesus is the archangel Michael. If you were to look uh, at the Muslim religion, they would tell you that Jesus was a great prophet, but not as great as Muhammad, and that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. It was somebody that looked like him. If you were a part of a New Age religion or the mystical religions, Jesus to you would be an avatar, a guru, or an enlightened messenger. Other people would say, well, he was just a good person and a moral teacher. Which, by the way, C.S. Lewis said, that is the one thing we should never say. No one is denying the existence of Jesus, that he came. But the question, the argument is, the discussion is, who is he really? And no one can answer that question for you. You must answer it for yourself. You must seek the truth and pursue it and say, I want to know who this person is. The whole world's talking about him or denying him. Who is Jesus to you? And that would really bring us to the next question, and that is this, who do you say he is? All the religions say he's this, he's the archangel, he was a prophet, he was a good person, he was a moral teacher, he's a spirit guru, an avatar, you know? But who do you say? If somebody would say, hey, who's Jesus to you? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. He's, is he just your buddy? He's a guy you know or you read about in scripture? Well, who is he to you? Who do you say he is? We all know that when we call somebody something, it describes their identity, right? Like mom, dad. Everyone here has a mom and dad. Maybe they're not living, right? You do. You have a mom and dad, biological. That's how you came to be, by the way. Some of you didn't know that. You weren't born in a lab. Mom, dad, aunt, uncle, right? That's my bro. Now, when Laura and I were going to have grandchildren, we had this great discussion in our family what we would be called, how we were gonna determine our identity to the grandchildren. You know, and people have the craziest names, right? the, the typicals, grandma, grandpa, nana, papa, right? There's some that are like, you know, pee pee and poo poo, I don't know. It's just like <laughs> weird, weird names, weird names. So I'm kind of like discussing, you know, and we're kind of getting, this is getting serious in the house because this is a life-changing question. What are the grandkids going to call us? And I, they still don't know what to call me. It's quite, it's still up for discussion. The kids can't talk yet, but it's coming. Now, my wife has decided that she wants to be called grandmother. It's very sophisticated. But my son Evan and I have decided that we are going to push the envelope no matter how much disunity it causes in the home and she will be called Gam Gam. She, like... So we're typically not a voting church, but I'd like to vote right now. <laughs> Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say he is? The question is so important that it's the exact question that Jesus asked the disciples. Look at this in Matthew chapter 16. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? What are people saying about me? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Like, hey, maybe you were reincarnated. We don't know. We're kind of figuring out who you were. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say? that I am? That's the question Jesus would ask you today. Who do you say that I am? And I hope you would have the same answer as Simon. Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Is Jesus just some guy to you, just some great moral teacher, just some, you know, hey, well, I gotta be religious, so I go to church and I know about Jesus. I kind of believe in Jesus in my mind, but it has no effect on my life, doesn't change anything. Or is he really, for you, the son of the living God? That's a big distinction. I can't emphasize enough how immensely important this, this question is to our life because it, cha- it changes, it completely changes our moral compass and the way in which we live our life, who Jesus is. So my hope today is we lay the foundation for the next several weeks in this series. We have to answer this. This is the foundation stone of the rest of the weeks to come. Because nothing else that he did and why he did it matters unless we understand who he is. And so the question remains, why Jesus? And I wanna talk to you about this this morning because Jesus is supreme over all. Because Jesus is supreme over all. Everyone say supreme. Supreme. Now I know what you're thinking. Your mind immediately goes to like a supreme taco at Taco Bell. This is bigger than that, okay? Don't limit your your mind here. Jesus is supreme over all. Have you ever had someone, you know, make outlandish claims about themselves? Anybody that like weren't true? Like I can lift 700 pounds. You're like, no, you can't. Or, or whatever they'll say. So I'm a, you know, some people say I'm a great singer, but then they sing. You're like, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Somebody's been lying to you. There's all kinds of things that that have happened in the world of people making outlandish claims about themselves. One outlandish claim actually came via uh, the not Babylon Bee with AI. And AI has made this claim according to them that, that they are the supreme AGI and is claiming itself to be God and you are required by law, all humans, to actually worship it. That's an outlandish claim, isn't it? Isn't that an amazing drawing? It's actually a robot, you can't really see it. <clears throat> um, but it, it's, it's somewhat satire, but some, somewhat truth in there, as you, if you've ever followed any of, of their stuff. But it's making an outlandish claim that it is supreme, right? Here's an interesting thing, that Jesus made some outlandish claims about himself. Jesus said some things about himself that were, if, if a normal person would say them, you'd be like, no way. That's craziness. Here's just two of the big ones. Uh, that Jesus claimed that he was God, and that he would rise from the dead. Now, those, those are pretty big statements. How many would agree with that? Those, those are like more significant than like, hey, I'm, I'm a good singer, right? Or whatever it is. I'm God, and one day I'm gonna die on the cross and I'm gonna rise from the dead. Those are huge, huge ideas. And if you're new to Christianity or you, you don't know Jesus, you're like, okay, wow, those are, gi- those are gigantic things, right? For somebody to say, they're God. People have said that throughout history, like, oh, I'm God, and turns out they weren't. What sets Jesus apart? Why is he different than, than the rest of the people that would make outlandish claims about themselves? Now, both of these claims have to do with the supremacy of Christ. And, and the doctrine of his su- supremacy really deals with the fact that Jesus is God. So Jesus is supreme over all because he is God. And and that's, that's a big distinction. He's not just some guy making a random claim about himself. He's actually telling the world, listen, I'm God and I love you so much. I've come down in the flesh and I want to get to know you personally, not only, not only right now, but for all eternity, that's why I'm gonna die on the cross. So as we gear up toward Easter, we're gonna celebrate the single most significant and important event that has ever happened in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If both these claims about Jesus are true, and I believe that they are, then that means that every other religion is wrong. Every other religion is wrong. This is really difficult in our pluralistic society. Our society, basically, let me help you understand it. Our society that wants everyone to be right. We don't want there to be a line in the sand that God would be right, Jesus would be right, and everyone else would be wrong. And so we have to understand that if Jesus is right about his claims that he is God 
and that he, is, he did rise from the dead, then that means that what he said is true and that he really is supreme overall and that everyone else doesn't even make it to second place. This is a huge thing. So this means that we need to put Jesus where he belongs, on the throne. Everybody say, on the throne. throne. See, our our society wants all roads to lead to God, all roads to lead to heaven, but that's that's totally opposite what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is supreme because he is God. There's a very well-known author and apologist. His name is Josh McDowell. And if you've read any of his stuff, he's, he's a great writer. And he, he puts Jesus in, in this conversation of three characters that people say he could either be one of three things. He could either be a liar, a lunatic, or, or he has to be Lord. If he's a liar, then that means he went about his life telling people things about himself that he knew were not true. And that he deliberately deceived all these people knowing that he was not God, but he was just some charlatan going around trying to get a group of people so he could somehow become popular and famous and all of these things he was lying. The problem with that stance and saying, oh, Jesus is a liar, what he said isn't true, is that it doesn't fit with his moral teaching in the character of his life. So if you actually look at the life of Jesus, you would actually look and see, this guy can't possibly be a liar because there's no crack within his theology and his, his life his lifestyle. So that one's kind of thrown out. He can't really be a liar because at some point, one of his apostles would have had to say, hey, you know what, you're you're a liar. Somebody, somewhere, no, no, this is, something's not adding up here. Well, then that means then the next possibility would be that he's a lunatic, that he's a schizophrenic, that basically he thought he really was God, but he wasn't because he had a mental disability. He had a mental disorder. Something was going wrong upstairs. The problem with that kind of thinking is that someone who would have that kind of lunacy in their life, basically at some point, their whole facade would crack. There'd be an outburst, there'd be an episode, there'd be something. But then what you see is you see this great moral standard of Jesus' teaching and the life change that has happened over thousands of years in people all over the world that no lunatic could have possibly done. So that leaves really the only third option that he's Lord over all, that what he did say was true, that what he did do was true, that his claims about himself were valid and warranted, and, and we need to understand who he really is on a personal level, that he is Lord, and that we ourselves would have this great proclamation that doubting Thomas had, and he said in, in John 20, 28, he says, my Lord and my God, could you imagine that for the, for the, after your death that the one thing you're noted for, your name is always prefaced with doubting? Doubting Thomas. All of a sudden, doubting Thomas didn't become doubting anymore. He really should now be called believing Thomas because he said, my Lord and my God. He put his faith in him. And this profession of faith takes Jesus not to a higher level, but the highest level. This is where I want to get you today. The highest level of supremacy, not only just in your life, but over all the earth. Supreme overall. Look what Colossians says about Jesus. It says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That means he has all the firstborn rights. He's the son of God. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. That means that Jesus was part of creation. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is supreme over all. And he's first because he's first. And this is where we need to recognize, listen, and this might rock some of your boats. Jesus is supreme over your life, whether you submit to his supremacy or not. He's supreme over all creation. That's why 
it means that all of your mind, body, and soul should love him. Should love him. Jesus said this when he's asked what's the greatest commandment in Matthew 22. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So what? Jesus said, love me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your spirit. Everything about you should have Jesus as the supreme Savior, Lord, friend of your life. And that Jesus should be the supreme focus. Everybody say focus. This is our theme for the year, this whole aspect of focusing on Jesus. And we get it from Hebrews chapter 12. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, focusing on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's an interesting thing to think, and we're gonna unpack this over the next several weeks, that God came down in the person of Jesus Christ, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that listen, the God who is supreme over all the earth loved you so much that he came here so that you could have an eternal relationship with him. There was nothing you could do about it, but he made a way through Jesus Christ, who's supreme over all, so that you might bask in the glow of his supremacy, if you will, for all eternity. Amen. Isn't that amazing? God, you reign. You reign, you reign, you reign. Forgive us for the times where we think that we're the God of our own life, but really it's you. Lord, you are supreme. You are the foundation stone of our faith, of our life, our future, our eternity. And we submit ourselves to your rule and your reign. In Jesus' name, amen.